Good afternoon and welcome to today's Tuesday Times Roundtable. A quick reminder, New York Times related, if you haven't already accessed your free New York Times subscription, that's part of FIU's partnership with the New York Times along with this event. So you can go to accessnyt, accessnyt.com and use your FIU credentials and you can get uh, full access to the New York Times website. I'm happy to introduce uh, both of today's moderators. Erica Harlitz Kern has a doctorate in medieval and early modern history from the University of Gothenburg, Sweden. She's an adjunct instructor here at FIU's Department of History, as well as a visiting scholar at the University of Miami. She is working on a research project on Swedish, Swedish colonial governors in North America and the Baltic between 1642 and 1655. And Vanessa Rodriguez Galindo holds a Master of Arts in Metropolitan History and a PhD in, heart, in Art History. She is currently working on a book project on visual, visual culture and urban identities in 19th century Spain. She has held research positions at the National Archives of the United Kingdom and has been a visiting scholar at the University of Westminster, the University of Zurich, and the University of Miami. She joined FIU's Department of History last year. In addition to teaching, she also works as an art consultant for museums and cultural institutions. Thank you both so much for being here today. Hear me? All right. Um, so my name is Erica Harlitz Kern, so you can distinguish between the two of us. And I'm going to be talking for the first half of this lecture, and then Vanessa is going to uh, join us and take us to the end. Um, so today's topic is cosmopolitanism and its myths. And uh, the word cosmopolitan is one of those words that we throw around without really thinking about what it actually uh, means. So, <coughs> excuse me. First off, we need to discuss what cosmopolitan actually means. And I guess this is what we think about first. The magazine Cosmo and all its advice on how to live our lives or mostly how women should live our lives. And also, of course, the cocktail, cosmopolitan. We are in South Florida after all, and what is an event without cocktails? But the word cosmopolitan is much older than these two uh, cultural phenomenons. And if we go to uh, Merriam-Webster, Merriam-Webster is excellent online. Uh, and we look at the definition of the adjective cosmopolitan. It says, having worldwide rather than limited or provincial scope or bearing, or having wide international sophistication worldly, um, composed of persons, constituents, or elements from all or many parts of the world, found in most parts of the world and under varied ecological conditions. So what we will be talking about here is this kind of cosmopolitan, a person who is, um, has some kind of international experience. Um, and this kind of cosmopolitan started to emerge in the 17th century in Europe. And these cosmopolitans were predominantly men, they were predominantly white, and they were predominantly Christians. And one example of a 17th century cosmopolitan is this man, Daniel Gabriel Fahrenheit. Um, Daniel Gabriel Fahrenheit is the inventor of the Fahrenheit temperature scale. He is also the inventor of the uh, mercury thermometer, which is the most common type of thermometer up until very, very recently when the digital thermometer started taking over. And Daniel Gabriel Fahrenheit is um, interesting because he was born in Gdansk, Poland in 1686. And he died in The Hague in the Netherlands in 1736. At the, point of, at the point in time when Fahrenheit was born, Gdansk was a German city. 
it was part of what remained of the Hanseatic League. And the Hanseatic League was a corporation of independent cities uh, who dominated the Baltic and the North Sea during most of the Middle Ages. So uh, Gdansk was an independent German city within the borders of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. Because between the 15th century and the 18th century, Poland and Lithuania were a double state. And Fahrenheit's parents, as his last name might reveal to you, they were German and German speaking. So Fahrenheit was German, born into a German city within the borders of Poland. And Fahrenheit's parents were German merchants, and he was supposed to follow in their footsteps. So he moved to Amsterdam in the Netherlands to train to become a merchant. But soon he realized that he was more interested in physics, which at this point in time starts to develop into a science. So he left the career of a merchant and pursued studies in physics, and he also educated himself into becoming a glassblower. And the reason why he became a glassblower is because he needed to create his own lab equipment. So he attended universities in Berlin, Halle, Leipzig, and Dresden in Germany. He also went to Copenhagen in Denmark, and for a while he returned to Gdansk in Poland. But ultimately he settled in The Hague, where he set up shop as a physicist and an inventor. So the Fahrenheit temperature scale and the mercury thermometer were both invented in The Hague in the Netherlands by Daniel Gabriel Fahrenheit. Fahrenheit also traveled to England where he became a member of the Royal Society. And the Royal Society to this day is one of the most prestigious scientific uh, associations in the world. And one of their most famous members is of course Sir Isaac Newton, who formulated the laws of physics, uh, of gravity, and of mechanics, which still dominate physics today, although they are being rivaled by the uh, development of quantum physics. So Fahrenheit's life was not unusual during this time in Europe. But of course, not everybody could lead the kind of life that he led. Most notably, women were not allowed to study at universities at this point in time. And they could not travel freely the way men could. They either needed to travel in pairs, in groups, or with a man, whereas a man could just up and go. Um, and the same goes for Jews who lived in Europe at this time. Jews were invited and expelled to different parts of Europe at the whim of the local leaders. As we see in England already in 1290, in Spain in 1492, and pogroms were commonplace throughout Poland and Russia. But for a white Christian man of a certain social standing, Fahrenheit's life was not out of the ordinary. So now we need to return to the question of what is cosmopolitanism? What is the difference between a cosmopolitan and someone who moves around a lot? So if we break up the word into its component parts, we get two words. We get Cosmo and we get Polit. And Cosmo comes from the Greek word Cosmos, which means world. Polit also comes from Greek. It is the root to the Greek word for citizen. So cosmopolitan means world citizen. And its first recorded use 
in written English is in 1645. But why did the word cosmopolitan appear in the 17th century? People were moving around between different parts of the world long before that century. If we study the ancient Mediterranean, for example, we have a very dense exchange of people and goods and finances and ideas and religions going all the way back to Mesopotamia and ancient Egypt. In the Middle Ages, the Catholic Church and the different monastic orders it can be argued that they were somehow cosmopolitan. Because if you were, for example, a Cistercian monk, you would enter a monastery, for example, in France. But then the Cistercians would establish a monastery, say, in Sweden. And you, the French monk, would be sent to Sweden to be responsible for founding that monastery. So the word cosmopolitan appeared in the 17th century because something else began to develop at the same time. And that was the nation state. The nation state is the most common way of politically organizing territory. And today it is completely dominating how we organize geopolitical territories. And the idea of the nation state is based in the idea of nationalism. That you become loyal to one particular territory and its government. So during the 17th century and onwards, what we see developing in Europe is a dynamic between traveling and living across borders which has been going on for centuries, even thousands of years, and the expectations of being loyal to one state. And to handle this dynamic, a word was invented. And this word was cosmopolitan. During the 19th century, we see nationalism develop as an ideology. And According to nationalism, being a cosmopolitan is a problem. According to a nationalist, a cosmopolitan cannot be trusted because they are comfortable in more place than one. During the 19th century, Jews begin to be labeled as cosmopolitans because they are people without a nation. They belong nowhere. So to this day, we see nationalists talking about cosmopolitanism as a problem. And often, there is an anti-Semitic undertone in this rhetoric. But at the same time, the early idea of the cosmopolitan lives on today. The idea of a person comfortable anywhere in the world they are educated, they are sophisticated, they speak several different languages. A cosmopolitan identifies with several places at one time, while the nationalist identifies only with one. And as I said, Fahrenheit is an example of a lifestyle available to the few. And this, too, is part of the definition of cosmopolitan today. And if we return to Merriam-Webster, they offer a more detailed uh, definition of the word cosmopolitan. They say that a cosmopolitan is someone who is able to read the morning paper in Rio de Janeiro, attend a lecture in Madrid, and assist at a refugee camp in Uganda with equal ease and maybe all in the same week. This definition, though, is based on class, race, and nationality. To be able to go from Brazil to Spain to Uganda, you need to have money. 
You need to have a passport that opens borders for you. And you need to have a skin color that matches your passport. So based on this more detailed definition offered by Merriam-Webster, we can look at these pictures. The image on the left is from the Vanity Fair Oscar party in 2018, so earlier this year. The image on the bottom right is a Syrian family who have been granted asylum here in the United States. Because there is this idea that cosmopolitanism is something that is easy, that it is a matter of choice. But again, if we return to Fahrenheit, he is considered a cosmopolitan, but his life was not easy and his mobility was not by choice. He went to Amsterdam to train as a merchant instead of staying in Gdansk because both of his parents had died suddenly. So he went to where someone could help him. When he decides to shift careers from being a merchant to being a physicist, he is forced to travel between universities to find the exact kind of e education that he needed. It's not like today where you enroll at FIU and you try to graduate in four years in the same place. You move between universities and you take courses that suit your needs. And this is expensive. So not only did he have to travel between all these German universities and the Danish universities, he also needed to pay his way. And then he spent the rest of his life inventing instruments and making his own equipment. So defining what a cosmopolitan is is more complicated than we think. So if we return to the basic definition of what a cosmopolitan is, it is a person who is comfortable anywhere in the world, who speaks several different languages, who can navigate several different cultures, and who can identify with more than one place, more than one culture, on a level that is deeper than the visitor. But what we need to do here now then is to take into consideration the idea of home. because. We all call some place in the world home. It might be where we live. It might be somewhere else. And this includes this idea of home that roots us in the world. It includes the people on this screen. And then I would argue that the cosmopolitans on the screen are the people on the right and not the people on the left. Because the people on the left, they fly into Hollywood for the party, and then they fly on to somewhere else, and they do little toe dips into a certain type of culture, a certain type of income level, a certain type of racial make makeup. Whereas the Syrian family are looking for a new home they speak more than one language. They navigate cultures on a deeper level than a visitor. And they are most likely educated somewhat or a lot. But then again, if we twist this question a little further, aren't most people cosmopolitan on some level? If we dig deep enough, we all navigate several different cultures on a daily basis. Even if it's such a basic thing as deciding what we're going to have for dinner. Are we having pizza? Are we having Chinese, Cuban, Thai? What are we having? Several of us speak more than one language. We all come from somewhere else, either directly or indirectly. And if we don't move here from somewhere else, then most likely our neighbor did. 
And that in itself creates a cultural encounter that we need to deal with on a daily basis. So if most people are cosmopolitan then, I'm going to leave you with a few questions. If most people are cosmopolitan on some kind of level, is there even need for such a word? Does the cosmopolitan exist? Well, um, for the rest of the talk, I'm going to continue exploring some of the questions Erica has already uh, touched upon. What are the historical origins of cosmopolitanism? What did it mean to be a cosmopolitan in the past? And how do we view global citizenship today? And there are two main uh, issues that we, we want to emphasize throughout the talk. And the first is that globalization might be a hot topic. It's in the news, in the article you read, and in dozens or even hundreds of other pieces. But it has been around for some time, this discussion about what cosmopolitanism means. It's been around for centuries, even. And secondly, an important aspect to think about, and that uh, Erica also highlighted, is the definition of, cosmo of, of a cosmopolitan. We have to be very mindful of who is doing the defining. When we say uh, a person is a cosmopolitan, or a, a venue, or a cafe, or a restaurant has a cosmopolitan vibe, why do we say that? What makes us say that? What assumptions do we have that make us define something as cosmopolitan? And uh, I want to start out by addressing this question. What is the global turn? What does global mean to historians today? Erica and I were both historians. Uh, we study different time periods. We study different subdisciplines, different historical sources. But the debate surrounding globalization has had an impact on how we look at the past. Because history is, it's, it's a living discipline, it's, it's a living creature, and it changes as our present changes. We look at the past through all these different lenses and these different windows of different shapes and sizes. And that's how we put together uh, a, a picture of the past. So one of the most recent changes in history is called the global turn. And what does that mean? Well, we've long engaged with this question of what cosmopolitanism means and how people view themselves and the other. But today we pay special attention to the, uh, the global foundations, the global underpinnings of processes, of, of events, of phenomena that maybe a few decades ago we would have looked at through a different window, through a national one, or a local one, or a regional one. So, this, so the global turn is very important, probably one of the reasons we're, we're here today, because national boundaries, national borders don't always explain how, how societies develop. So by adopting this perspective, by looking at this diff a different window, the global window, we can study the past in a new light. And uh, Erica spoke of the origins of the term and what it meant to be a cosmopolitan in the 17th century. So I'm going to tell you a bit about the 19th century. And in the 19th century, citizens were connected to each other, not the same as today. Of course, they didn't have smartphones or the internet. But there was a debate similar to the discussions we do see today. People debated whether or not they wanted to be cosmopolitan. What was at stake if they adopted foreign fashion instead of local ones? So they, re they reflected on their own local identity and how they interacted with the rest of the world. And why the 19th century? Why is the 19th century important? Well, Already in the late 18th century, economy was revitalized across the globe and new networks of commerce and transatlantic trade were established. But it's in the 19th century when daily life, when the fabric of daily life really does 
change, especially in cities, in European cities. And why is that? Well, because of the Industrial Revolution. So together with these new networks of trade and the technological advances introduced by the Industrial Revolution, everyday life, especially in cities, is altered. And some examples of this change include transportation, new networks of uh, systems of, uh, of railroad transport, which changed how items, how goods and people circulated, uh, the omnibus, the subway, uh, or the tram. A second uh, novelty um, were new forms of consumerism, new patterns of consumption. For example, the first department stores are established in the second 19th century. So leisure was associated to, to purchasing, to, to buying items, and especially the press. The printed uh, media, there was a, a sort of a revolution in, 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 the, uh, in the printing techniques used to reproduce newspapers. And this increased the quality and the quantity of the magazines and newspapers that were printed across the West. So this improvement in communication and transport during this, uh, seven, the 19th century forever changed how ideas were transmitted, how people accessed information, and how they even moved around. So I want you to uh, look at these images here. They're from an illustrated magazine, a Spanish illustrated magazine from the second half of the 19th century. And it's an example of how different networks of transnational exchange played out in something as, as common as wearing a dress. So here we see some women, they're in Madrid, and they're wearing very elaborate uh, dressers inspired by French fashion houses made with different materials, possibly Chinese silk or Italian embroidery that were brought from their places of origin to Madrid by ship, by trains made of English steel, or by carriages. And there they're taken to uh, a, uh, a local fashion house where fa uh, French sewing machines were used and new inventions in English dye. A local seamstress who had migrated from a rural town in Spain might have come to make the adjustments for these ladies in question who were later sketched by local illustrators and reproduced on the pages of these newspapers that were printed using German printing machines. So as you see, there's this whole uh, network of exchange. But of course, this was limited to that, this class here, the upper middle classes of the, of the period. Now, did these women feel cosmopolitan when they read these magazines? Perhaps they did, perhaps they didn't but they did want more information of what was going on outside their city, what other women were wearing in the rest of the world. And here uh, you see the, the covers of various illustrated magazines. So illustrated newspapers were gazettes. They were printed on a weekly, on a biweekly, or, or on a monthly basis, and they set the foundations for modern day journalism, for photojournalism. So if you look at the covers, you see how, how similar they are, right? You have uh, a similar layout, similar logo, and uh, even similar names. These covers are from different cities across the, the globe. So we have Buenos Aires, London, Rome, Paris, Madrid, and they imitated one another. They adjusted certain aspects from their uh, some certain national and local aspects and borrowed illustrations from other magazines. And they printed events of, of incidents, of, of phenomena happening all over the globe. So if you look at that, the uh, image on the right hand corner, that's a Spanish magazine from Madrid called La Ilustración Española depicting the head of the Statue of Liberty at a universal exhibition in Paris before being shipped to New York. So in a way, citizens, even though they, they, maybe they didn't have the means to travel, they could read these newspapers at home and feel that they were part of a world that reached beyond 
their own city, they're beyond their own place. And looking at these images, I'm sure you see that there's a common visual language, right? And I want to compare this with, with Netflix. It might seem like a far-fetched comparison, but uh, Netflix has a certain type of visual language that appeal, appeals to viewers across the world. So do we feel more cosmopolitan when we watch the latest hit from Spain in, or Argentina in Miami? Maybe we do, maybe we don't, but we are consuming a national product made by local actors that however speaks to viewers across the world and has a worldwide platform. Why? Because it's written in a visual language that we understand, that we can read. So we think that Netflix is doing something that's very original and innovative, and it is, but looking at these illustrations, it becomes obvious that people have been communicating in similar ways for a very long time. So a, a question I, I can't really answer is how did people, did people feel, right, cosmopolitan? But in the 19th century, there were uh, certain debates regarding cosmopolitanism, what it means to be a cosmopolitan. And the concept was usually linked to trade, to commerce, and to fashion. And there were already conflicting definitions in the 19th century. Uh, for example, in Spain, one author defined being cosmopolitan as a citizen of the universe, while another said that being a cosmopolitan was feeling other countries as your homeland. And why do I bring this up? Well, because in the 19th century, as Eric mentioned, was the 19th century was a fundamental period in the creation of the nation, national identities. So at the time in the 19th century, we have these two ways of thinking. There's a feeling of, of, of nationalism and also of cosmopolitanism, feeling that you belong to a distinct national entity on the one hand and being aware of foreign cultures and transnational networks on the other. And at this time, there was a discussion similar to the ones we have today. Citizens felt they were losing a sense of local identity because of foreign cultures. They spoke of what authentic meant versus foreign. Some people resisted change, and others embraced it because they believed that was the path towards progress. So in a way, their, their concerns and their anxieties regarding cross-national exchange were very similar to ours. They were having this debate. And the bridge I want to draw between being a cosmopolitan in the 19th century and being one today is in the 19th century, what they were discussing was an attitude, a way of looking at the world. Of course, politics was involved with this, so was commerce and trade. But they were describing how they felt. They didn't speak of being global citizens. And when did we incorporate something as particular, as specific as citizenship into this debate? When we say we feel or we don't feel like global citizens, are we speaking of something as concrete as citizenship? Or are we actually talking about a state of mind, of our tastes, of our attitude, how we see the world? Because citizenship entails obligations and privileges with the country you're a citizen of. We need certain things from our country. We need health care. We need education. We need a pension. We need a passport. And we have obligations as well. We pay tax, we vote, we obey the law. So I might feel a cosmopolitan, like I might feel like I'm a citizen of the world, but I don't have a passport from that place. I don't have a global citizen passport. But the rise of this debate today of global citizenship puts the spotlight perhaps on the fact that our ideas of national identity are, are somewhat obsolete. Do national identities articulate how we feel about our home? about our town or about our country. Living here in Miami, you might feel you have a US passport, but you might feel closer to someone living in, 
Cuba and Haiti and Mexico and Argentina and feel less, you have less in common with someone living in Maine, although you share that same passport. So national identities are contested all the time. And in a sense, saying we're global citizens is challenging certain ideas of, of national identity. As the article that, we, uh, that this talk is based on, the article states that or argues that a graduate from London may have more in common with a graduate from Paris or a graduate from New York. The internet has, has speeded up this, this process because social media transcends national boundaries, for example, transcends some physical boundaries that were in place decades ago. And national identities, they're constantly being rethought. Wars have been have been waged to define what a nation should be and, and what it should look like. And some might, might argue that now we're at a crossroads again because access and informa to information and mobility have changed how we view ourselves and how we view the other, the same way the press did in the 19th century. So the, the question that seems to follow, that seems natural to me at least, is Will global city states or global nations exist someday? Will we ever have a passport, a global passport? Uh, will there be small global spaces with their own laws, their own regulations? This, of course, isn't a reality, and there would be multiple requirements to have that specific passport. But I just want to look at some experiments that we see today in global uh, spaces. So uh, I'm sure you know WeWork. WeWork is a co-working space. And there are several co-working spaces in Miami. But WeWork is a chain. It's a company. It's a chain of co-working spaces across the globe. And you pay a specific fee to access your local office. And then you can pay an extra fee. You can travel to different cities in the world and work from there. So you can live, work from Miami, Mexico City, Manila. And some companies have taken this one step further, like Rome, and they've incorporated co-living into the equation. So you have the same deal, but not only do you work here, you also live here, and you can pick up your things and leave whenever you want, which is also very convenient because we need to renew our visas. So there's this co-living space exists in San Francisco, in London, in Bali, in Miami, and in Tokyo. And you see here in this image, they use a certain aesthetic. All these co-working spaces do that, right? You have the modern and straight lines of modern architecture you see in San Francisco or London. And they, they incorporate the lush vegetation of the tropics into, into that picture. So people who, who live and work in these spaces, they have what we could call an imaginary passport, right, to access these different spaces. And they all share this sort of industrial, Ikea-like decor and the mid-century lamps and mood lighting and all that kind of stuff. And if you work in these places, you would probably share a common identity with the people there. They probably have a university degree. They probably speak English and one or two more languages. They might have Amazon Prime. And they master search engines that allow them to travel throughout the world. And the article in the New York Times refers to this global tribe as weird, Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic. So the people who live in these spaces, they do indeed travel across the globe. They're up to date on global events, global news. And to a degree, they are open to new local experiences. But are they cosmopolitan in the sense that they are open to diverse social groups with no little or inappropriate education? Or are they open to different ethnic backgrounds? The definition of a cosmopolitan that the article suggests is someone who is open to difference and embraces that difference. 
So what the author does in that article is he puts the spotlight on some of the contradictions we associate to cosmopolitanism. Right? A global so citizen has socially inclusive values, but access to these circles are not open. They're exclusive to a privileged social class. So in these spaces, you see people from all over the world. They're not nationally homogeneous, but they are homogeneous in other ways, at different levels. You have a similar education, values, language, lifestyle, goals, and even tastes. Money, what we might think of um, an indicator of how much money you have, say property, isn't as important in these spaces. And why is that? Because being mobile is more important than being permanent. So what are the uh, potential outcome of creating these type of global spaces? They're, they're in a way, they're experiments. This, in, in the benefits, we can see the benefits and the disadvantages of, of what a potential global city-state might look like. So there's a positive side. This kind of, of citizen might end up being open to other people, other customs, other identities, and living experiences of local cu cultures firsthand. In these spaces, your past and your ethnicity doesn't really matter, and knowledge is valued more than money or social background. I mean, that would be, I would think, some of the, the, positive, the positive side to, to this phenomena. Or we can think of a darker side, that the people here become fervent gatekeepers of, of a global identity with the same passion as a nationalist or a patriot blindly defending the ruthless tactics of his or her nation. So is it just another type of national identity and social discrimination masked of openness? And this is a question we have to ask ourselves. So throughout history, religion and the nation have been elements that have defined our identities and a sense of belonging. And the debate regarding cosmopolitanism and global citizenship prompts another question. Is global citizenship just another way to express our need to belong? Thank you. Produced by Academic Video Services within the Division of Information Technology at Florida International University.